So continuing, we are at ke to the minus rt, probability under q of log of s0 divided by k plus r minus one half of sigma squared multiplied by t, and that's less than xi multiplied by sigma square root of t, so we're going to move that directly there. So that's the probability that xi is, yeah, that uh, xi is less than, sorry, here it should be less than, log of s0 over k plus r minus one half of sigma squared t divided by sigma square root of t. And that's exactly n of d2. So the second term in our fundamental asset pricing formula coincides with the second term in the uh, Black-Scholes formula. But now we know what n of d2 is. n of d2 is the probability of exercise under q, and it has to be a normal distribution because the log of s is, no, is a normal, well, is normally distributed. s is log normally distributed because it's a geometric Brown motion. Therefore, the log of a geometric Brown motion has to be Gaussian. And that's how we get the normal distribution. So it all comes from our assumptions. Next, we deal with the first expectation, which is expectation under Q of BT inverse ST times the indicator function of exercise. So this is actually S star T. times the indicator function of exercise. And we can write that as expected value under Q of uh, S0, that's the same thing as S0 star, times exponential of sigma XTQ minus one half of sigma squared T multiplied by the indicator function of exercise. This is a constant we will move it out. And we arrive here, and here we are stuck. We got an exponential that's uh, in the middle of the way, and we've got this thing that's actually quite nonlinear. So we can't take that out of the expectation. This is nonlinear, so we don't know how to deal with these two terms. But then we'll remember one thing when we introduce Gersanov. There are two uses to Gersanov. So now think about a, a, a flashback, you know. You've got this flashback scene going on, and then there are two uses of Gersanov. The first one is planned. That's when you look at the Brown motion. The second one, when you look at the radom nicodym derivative at the exponential martingale, the second one is opportunistic. There should be an opportunity here. But there's a little problem here. So let's rewrite that as S0 expected value under Q of exponential of integral from zero to T sigma X T Q minus one half of integral from zero to T sigma squared DT times the indicator function of exercise. So now it looks much more like an exponential martingale except for one detail. The detail is that here I got a plus for the Brownian for the Brownian motion term, so it should be dxt. 
while in my definition of exponential martingales, I always had a minus. Nah, just a sign problem and everything seems to go off the rail. But wait a minute, xt is a Brownian motion, so we know it's symmetric, right? So if it's symmetric, maybe the plus or the minus do not matter that much. So maybe that's also an exponential martingale. So something that I could interpret as a random Nicodym derivative and make go away. And it turns out that that's exactly the case. We got another version of Gersanoff in terms of something that you find in some papers, it's no longer a very popular notation, but you still find it occasionally because it's uh, quite concise, it's the curly E. The curly E, uh, you find it mostly for jump diffusion processes, but sometimes for diffusion processes, that denotes the stochastic or doléant exponential. And the doléant exponential is uh, an exponential martingale, but with a plus here and not a minus. So it turns out that we can define Gersanoff for the stochastic exponential, and entirely in terms of the stochastic exponential, the doléant exponential. So that's exponential of integral from zero to t theta s dxs minus one half integral from zero to t theta s squared ds. So as long as here we've got a minus, we don't care about the sign there. If it's a plus, it's a standard exponential martingale. If it, uh, sorry, if it's a minus, it's a standard exponential martingale. If it's a plus here, then we've got a Dolian exponential. But in either cases, we can define a change of measure and we can also have a Brownian motion under the new measure. Now, one little uh, thing to pay attention to. We got a plus here. So over there, we will have a minus. If you go back in time to Now that's a bit too far. Here, if you go back in time to Gersanov theorem version 1.0, we had a minus there, we have a plus here. So there's a little trick to remember. If the dx term has a minus, you will have a plus here. If you've got a plus here, you will have a minus there. However, if you have a doléant exponential, you will have a plus here and a minus there. So the sign are reversed between the random Nicodeme and the definition of your Brown motion. So that's the only trick that you need to uh, really remember. But for the rest, when you use it, you can get problems out of your way. So, now, if I go back to uh, my note, now we know that this is a doléant exponential. So we can write it out as a change of measure process from a measure, our measure Q to a measure Q bar. So we use that as a way to define dq bar over dq. So that's our new random, new random Nicodym derivative. Let's call it lambda bar. As exponential of theta xtq minus one half sigma squared t. And under the new q measure, we can define the new q bar measure as based on the Brown motion minus a bit of volatility. And that gives us the new Brown motion under p under Q bar. So what we've done so far is start from planet Earth with P and then, and with XT. Then we move to planet Q, to planet finance, so planet Q with DQ over DP. 
and we define XTQ, the brain motion, so the model for risk in planet finance. And we did that with XTQ is equal to XT plus mu minus r divided by sigma times time. Now we are defining a new measure, q bar, with dq bar over dq. I'm not telling you what planet it is yet, but I'm going to tell you that the unit of risk over there, the process for risk over there, x uh, bar t is given by x bar t is equal to x q t minus sigma t. So of course you can then unravel that to get x bar t as a function of x t. You see, we can hop directly from p to q bar if we want, if we, if we so wish. Uh, we build that sequentially. A planned use in order to get the fundamental asset pricing formula, and then an opportunistic use, and we're going to see why this opportunistic use is so nice. So here the key point was the fundamental asset pricing formula. Integral one was EQ of, uh, so S zero here, EQ of exponential of sigma x t q minus one half of sigma squared x uh, um, t times the indicator function of exercise. Let's open this expectation up, write it as an integral with respect to dq. So that's S0 integral over omega of something with respect to dp, uh, dq bar, so <clears throat> dq. So that's our expectation here. Now this, we've used it to define a new measure q bar. So this exponential here, this dollar exponential is actually a random Nicodem derivative, it's dq bar over dq, and then we still have unchanged the indicator function of exercise. So what must happen will happen, the two dqs take care of each other, and we are left with s0 multiplied by our expectation expressed as an integral, but now it's with respect to the q bar measure. So we can rewrite that as S0 time expectation under the measure q bar of the indicator function. Now you know that the expected value of an indicator function is a probability. So that's S0 times the probability under the measure q bar that our stock is above the strike, ends up above the strike, and our option is exercised. So this is the q bar probability of exercise. And of course we could follow the same steps as we did with the measure q to find to uh, find that actually this corresponds, this is the same thing as S0 n of D1. That's really the same derivation again with the same tricks again. So n of D1 is a probability of exercise, but not in the real world. It's in another world. So we set out to create one equivalent measure to make the mess go away, to make our calculation easy. We ended up finding two equivalent probability measures. How many do we, do we have really? 
Well, it turns out that we have stumbled onto something that is much wider, and that's pretty much going to uh, conclude the lecture tonight. An idea that's much wider. So just a few concluding notes uh, here. Now we know, thanks to the probability uh, approach, what n of d1 and n of d2 are really. They are probability based on normal distribution, and that stems directly from our assumption that st follows a log normal distribution. The probability under q of exercise uh, exercising the option at maturity is n of d2. The probability under q bar is n of d1. Now we've stumbled onto something that's a little bit bigger, which is the idea of a numeraire pair. The idea of the numeraire pair extends this fundamental asset pricing formula to tell you that if you discount by an asset, you can always find a measure that acts as equivalent probability measure for another equivalent martingale measure for another asset. And that's essentially what we've got. We discounted by the, uh, using the bank account, and we got Q. So a numera pair NT QN is comprised of a numera process NT. That's any stochastic process that's positive because it's interpreted as the price of a security. So it needs to be positive. And an equivalent martingale measure QN. So if you pick a numeraire, you can find an equivalent martingale measure. And if you pick or find a, uh, an equivalent martingale measure, you can always try to look for the numeraire because your fundamental asset pricing formula doesn't just work with B, T, and uh, the Q measure. It works for any numeraire pair. So you use one asset to discount, and when you take the expected value under the paired uh, measure, you will get the derivative price. So if you imagine what we did so far was to get to the Q measure, we discounted everything using the bank account. So the bank account was the currency in our economy. So we discounted using the bank account. We found the Q measure, and we found the first fundamental asset pricing formula. But just imagine what would happen if we were shifting in an economy where everything is priced in terms of stock. You go to do your groceries, you pay for your groceries using stock. You pay for your utility bill using stock, not using cash, not using the bank account. Then you would be able to discount everything using the stock, and it turns out that the equivalent martingale measure for our problem would actually be Q bar. So we already found two equivalent probability measures and two numeraire pairs tonight. BTQ which gave us n of d2, and st q bar, which give us n of d1 in Black-Scholes. And there are many, many more. So for example, if you ask about pricing a derivative under the real world uh, measure p without changing measure, well, the appropriate discounting asset would be the log optimal or Kelly portfolio. So for those who... Uh, uh, so Bill Zimba of so his lecture he was referring a lot to the Kelly portfolio. Kelly portfolio is a fundamental concept in portfolio selection whenever you're dealing with dynamic portfolios. And it also pops up its head whenever we want to do pricing because if you want to price under the real world measure, your discounting asset is actually this Kelly portfolio. And the problem is that the Kelly portfolio, well, the Black Shores model is just too narrow to give us a good characterization of what that is. So we would not get really a very accurate price if we were using it. Um, so we talk about that not in module six anymore, that's in the extra lecture.
So the fundamental asset pricing formula does not depend on the measure you're in. And if you think about your uh, binomial model, there are many binomial implementation out there. Each of these implementation is actually tied up into a discounting asset and a probability. So if you fix the probability, you will get a different discounting asset. If you fix the discounting asset, you will get different probability. Okay? So that's also why people tend to have a kind of mystical view of change of measure. It's also because of this result. What we've done tonight is not unique, but it was dictated by the problem, or it flowed from the problem. But it, it enabled us to see that we could price any derivative using combination of discounting asset and probability uh, measures to help us get our calculations, make our calculations a bit easier. So uh, just to conclude, I'm going to leave Feynman Cat for tomorrow because it also has its place to play tomorrow. So Feynman Cats, I'll talk about it right at the beginning tomorrow. But to conclude, we saw that n of d1 is the probability of exercise when we are in Q bar and when we discount using the stock price. That we didn't exactly see, but I, I tell you. And n of d2 is the probability of exercise in the real world, in the risk neutral world Q. So when we discount using the bank account. But to go back to this interview question, what is the real world probability of exercise? Well, it's not something we can see inside the Black-Scholes equation, but it's something that we can calculate very easily. Because the real world probability of exercise is the probability that ST is going to be greater than K in the real world. And following the same idea, it's therefore the probability that S0 exponential of mu minus one half of sigma squared T plus sigma x t, so that's the real world Brownian motion, is greater than k, which is the probability that you take the log now, that log of s0 over k plus mu minus one half of sigma squared t is greater than minus sigma x t. So still using the same trick, that's the probability that log of s0 over k plus mu minus one half of sigma squared t less than divided by sigma square root of t is greater than let's call it xi prime. And xi prime is n0 1. So this formula is actually, let's call it n of d0. It's a normal distribution. And this thing, let's call it d0. So if you look at it, d0 is equal to mu minus one half of sigma squared t. Uh, sorry, uh, I forgot the log of s0 k. So it's log of S0 divided by K plus mu minus one half of sigma squared times T divided by sigma square root of T. It's the same thing as D2, but instead of having a R here for the risk neutral drift, it has a mu for the real world drift. You see? So you could really calculate it without knowing anything about Black Scholes. The only problem is this is utterly useless in the real world because we don't know how to estimate mu. We're back to what we were saying in terms of portfolio selection, which is getting your uh, drift or getting your expected return is a pain. 
It's certainly not constant, and estimating it is difficult. That's why n of d0 is useless from a practical perspective. But it's still a great interview question to see if somebody really knows their black shorts. So I'm going to leave it here for, tom for tonight. Tomorrow we'll only, we'll pretty much be dealing uh, exclusively with the binomial model. So all we will need are to know how to add, subtract, divide, multiply. We'll use a little bit of uh, Taylor, but just in order not to uh, lose any of our good old habits. And we are going to try to connect the dots between the binomial model, the PDE approach, and the probability approach. What does it all mean, and why does it give us the same answer? <laughs>